Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the first and second letters of Peter. This is lesson number nine in that series from May 27 to 2017, and we are beginning the second book, or the second letter of Peter in this uh, lesson. We hope you have your Bible handy, because we're going to be looking at a number of Bible verses, but especially we ask that you'll bow your heads with us right now. We may begin with prayer. Our wonderful Father, in these short letters of Peter, we review many of the marvelous things that you did by sending your Son. And now as we realize what we have been asked to do in response to that marvelous event, may it be clearer and clearer to us as we study this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are not many places in Scripture, in fact, I'm not sure if I know any, that are crammed with as much information in a few verses as in Second Peter, especially this first chapter. He talks about righteousness by faith. He talks about what God can and should do in our lives. He talks about how we can become partakers of the divine nature and then how to avoid the corruption and lust that's in the world. That's a pretty heavy load for a few verses. Then in verses uh, 5 through 7, we have the famous Peter's Ladder. Finally, Peter talked about the assurance of salvation, the promise of eternal life, and even included a few words about the nature of man and the state of the dead. Well, Peter starts out by calling himself a slave of Jesus Christ. He was certainly not the first one to make such a statement. Can you think of others who called themselves a slave of Jesus Christ? Well, we know there was Moses, Deuteronomy 34, 5, and some other places. Joshua, Joshua 24, 29. David, 2 Samuel 3, 18. Psalm 70, verse 70. Uh, Paul, Romans 1, Philippians 1, Titus 1. James, the brother of Christ, in his, in his, his introduction to his book of James. And Jude, an introduction to his book. And there were others. So what, what does it mean? I mean, we have been so long, most of the world at least, away from the idea of slaves. We've sort of forgotten what a slave really is. So here's some comments about what a slave really was like in the days of Peter. One, he was to be called a slave, uh, meant to be, God was, I mean, a slave of God, it meant to be inalienably possessed by God. In the ancient world, a master possessed his slaves in the same sense as he possessed his tools. A servant can change his master, but a slave cannot. The Christian inalienably belongs to God. Two, to call the Christian the doulos of God, the slave of God, means that he is unqualifiedly at the disposal of God. In the ancient world, the master could do what he liked with his slave, even though he had even the power of life and death over him. The Christian has no rights of his own, for all his rights are surrendered to God. Three, to call the Christian the doulos, or slave of God, means that he owes an unquestioning obedience to God. A master's command was a slave's only law in ancient times. In any situation, the Christian has but one question to ask, Lord, what will you have me to do? The command of God is his only law. And four, to call the Christian the doulos or slave of God means that he must be constantly in the service of God. In the ancient world, the slave had literally no time of his own. No holidays, no leisure, all his time belonged to his master. The Christian cannot either deliberately or unconsciously compartmentalize life into the time activities which belong to God and the time and activities in which he does what he likes. How many Christians do you know that think that a certain brief period, either on Sunday morning or maybe on Sabbath morning, belong to God and the rest of the week belongs to them? Well, the Christian is necessarily the man every moment of whose time is spent in the service of God. This is William Barclay in his letters of James and Peter in the Daily Study Bible. Well, does that excite you to be slaves of God? One thing, it would total 
commitment on on the part of uh, Peter or uh, Paul or so forth. It was a voluntary. It wasn't uh, mm -hmm. uh, they could opt out mm -hmm. at their own choosing, but uh, they were totally committed. I w once gave a sermon in Africa at a school where I was working, um, and I said, I got up in front of them and said, you may not realize this, but I'm a slave. And of course, you can imagine how that sort of yeah. grabbed them, <laughs> I said. And I'm a slave for this reason, and I want you to think about it out there as well. A Christian who really has the gospel burning in his bones can't keep quiet about it. This is not a voluntary thing. It's not, well, I'll do it today, I won't do it tomorrow. If you really are committed to Christianity and it really is a fire in your bones, you, you have to talk about it, you have to do something about it all the time, every day. That's where there is a big difference between being a slave of God and being a slave of the devil. Yeah. Because when, if we are possessed by the devil, it means that he takes control of us. Mm -hmm. If we are possessed with God, to such an extent that we want to do His will. All of a sudden, we are voluntary slaves. Self-control. Yeah. You've been mm -hmm. granted that's the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, fruit of the Spirit. Well, Peter goes on in that same chapter, um, talking about the people to whom he was addressing himself, and that's one of the questions. We've talked about these people in the northern territory of, of, um, of um, what we would call modern Turkey, Asia Minor in those days, some of them who were descendants of immigrants from France. They were called the Gauls, and that's why their territory was called Galatia. And he says, you have received a faith as precious as ours. Now, is he now thinking of Europeans versus Semites? Is he thinking of um, Jews versus Gentiles? Well, the word there, the word precious, really means uh, of equal value. So Peter is saying, I want you to know I'm handing to you everything that I count precious. Everything that's most important to me in my life, I'm giving it to you. It's of equal value. It should be of equal value to, to you as it is to me. And of course, that includes all of us. So these comments suggest that Peter once again was saying that Gentile Christians, for an example, have been welcomed into a relationship with Jesus Christ equal that to that formerly offered to the Jews. And just a little bit of historical trivia, at what point did the um, special ministry of God <coughs> to the Jews end? Oh, you, stoning of Stephen. With the stoning of Stephen, do you remember what the date was for that? that 80. Uh, be three and a half years after the cross. <laughs> okay, the cross came 31. in the spring of AD 31, so... 34. 34, yeah, it, it was 34. 34, the fall of 34. Yeah, exactly. Perfect fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel. Well, Peter goes on to say that the divine power has been given to us. Divine power has been given us to us through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue become like Jesus Christ. Now that's a lot of sort of, you know, you don't, you don't just immediately, that doesn't immediately flow. What does that mean? Through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue to become like Jesus Christ. What do you think that means? Are we given divine power? We're given divine humility capable of developing divine love. Okay. Very good. Well, I, I think God is the only source. I, I think of, you know, it's not like you have your love and I have my love. We, we can only have God's love. And uh, Ellen White talks about that vital connection. Mm -hmm. And I think those qualities of spirit that are only in God we are connected, and that's where the power comes from. That's what drives our actions, the, mm -hmm. the love, the uh, joy, the peace uh, that comes from God uh, is what, again, causes our actions, or should. Yeah, unless exactly. Unless we walk after a different spirit. Um, let's read the first four verses of Second Peter 1. I'm reading from my Good News Bible. 
from Simon Peter, a servant, we've, that's the word slave there, and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have been given a faith as precious as ours. May grace and peace be yours in full measure through your knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. So grace and peace are supposed to come through our knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. God's divine power has given us everything we need to live a truly righteous life through our knowledge, again he's talking about knowledge, of the one who called us to share in his own glory and goodness. In this way he has given us the very great and precious gifts he promised, so that by means of these gifts you may, be, you may escape from the destructive lust that is in the world and may come to share the divine nature. So how does knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ have that kind of power? We, well, I think it's experiential knowledge, not mm -hmm. just information about, because the devil has information about. Yeah. But he has separated himself from God. So, uh, so knowing some about somebody and knowing them as a person, interacting with them is is a, is different. Even though we use the same word. Did, did Adam and Eve have the opportunity of becoming perfectly like God? Yes. Certainly. So what has changed to us is, of course, sin. And we have alienated ourselves from God. We have been separated. We have been defaced. We have been degraded. But Peter talks about being born again. And that's, that's supposed to give us the opportunity to be restored into the divine image. And this happens through a cooperative effort. Now we need to talk about that. What's a cooperative effort? Between ourselves and the Holy Spirit. We need to take the time to allow the Holy Spirit to do His work. And then there's this absolutely incredible statement from the Desire of Ages. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, He will so identify Himself with our thoughts and aims so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to His will that when obeying Him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing His service. When we know God, there's the knowledge we're talking about, when we know God as it is our privilege to know Him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, that would be having a good knowledge about him, an appreciation of his character. Through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Wow. Desire of Ages 668, paragraph 3. That's an incredible statement. Just incredible. Well, I guess the question we need to ask you out there, and you need to ask yourselves, we need to ask ourselves, what difference has your Christian faith made in your life? I'll let you think about that. Well, 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7 reveals what's known as Peter's ladder. There are other places in the Bible where there are sort of similar things. There's one in Romans 5, 3 to 5, one in James 1, 3 and 4, and one in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And um, let's just look at those for a second. I've taken the liberty of, of lining up the, the uh, things that are being mentioned here. I can't quite get them all on one screen, but 2 Peter 5, uh, 1, 5 to 7, we have faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, Christian affection, and love. In Romans, we have Romans 5, 3 to 5, troubles, endurance, God's approval, hope. James 1, 3 to 4, we have faith, endurance, perfection. And Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. So, looking back over those, what do you see is a repeated occurrence? What, what, what are the, which of these things occur several times? Well, faith, uh, faith? starts off two of them. Yeah. And uh, uh, faithfulness uh, appears in fruit of the Spirit. Okay. And then there's self-control. Self -control. Endurance appears more than three times. Mm -hmm. uh, love, obviously. So making lists of virtues was a common, commonly done in ancient times. 
the scholars, the, 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 the prophets, even the, the pagan prophets like to make lists of virtues. In this case, Peter put together his list of what he thought were most important, and he organized it in the form of a ladder. What's, what's the significance of organizing it in the form of a ladder? Well, I, I question that I, I, ladder isn't expressly stated. It's, yeah. it's an interpretation. And he says to add mm -hmm. virtue to your faith and knowledge to your, you know. So I almost visualize it more as a piling on of one I thing see. over the other. So as your faith grows, you can support more and more of the things as as you build, uh, but that's just my yeah. <laughs> I thought. Well, faith is is a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a friend, right? Virtue is the, the Greek word arete is means that particular word means a good quality of any kind, just goodness. It was heralded among pagan, among pagan philosophers. Yes, faith is crucial, but it must lead to a changed life, one in which virtue is expressed. And then knowledge. Peter surely isn't talking of knowledge in general, rather than knowledge that comes from a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Temperance, self-control. Mature Christians are able to control their impulses, particularly those impulses that lead to excesses. Patient steadfastness. Steadfastness is endurance, especially in the face of trials and persecutions. Godliness. In the pagan world, the word translated here as godliness means ethical behavior that results from a belief in a god, in a god. Within the New Testament, it also carries a concept of ethical behavior that results from belief in the one true God, 1 Timothy 2, verse 2. And then brotherly kindness, and uh, some of the modern translations have Christian kindness. Christians are like a family, and godliness will lead to a community in which people are kind to one another. And finally, love, the agape kind of love. Peter brings the list to a climax with love. He sounds like Paul, too, where Paul says, And now abide of faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love, in 1 Corinthians 13. 13. And that, of course, were words taken from our Bible study guide. So, after saying that the virtues and the relationship that we can have with Jesus Christ is a gift, Peter said we must make every effort to attain these virtues. Hold on, wait, back up. Huh? <laughs> uh, do you work for gifts? Well, Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 says no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is mm -hmm. Christ Jesus. But mm -hmm. let each man be careful how he uh, builds on the foundation, either with uh, wood, hay, or stubble, or uh, gold, silver, or precious stones. So we have some choice in how we relate to, to God, uh, evidently, because uh, we, uh, you know, like the seed that uh, got caught up in the cares of this life was choked out and was not as fruitful as it could have been. Uh, so we can we can add the wrong things to our lives and shrivel, you know, or we can add the good things. We can seek after those things that will build our faith and put away all those things that will hinder our faith so that our foundation is strong and can support all these other things. I, I see a problem in translation here, personally. Okay. Because we need to look at this verse 5 in the context of verse 4. Yeah. And in verse 4, we partaking of God's nature. So by the time we get to verse 5, it's not so much by uh, an effort. Mm -hmm. It's by the same diligence, which would be a literal translation. By the same diligence. Which one? The diligence of partaking of God's nature. And this is what causes mm -hmm the changes in us. And that happens. Basically, our part is to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work in us. Mm. When you, we do that through Bible study. We do it through par prayer. We do it through sharing with others. Those are times when we're doing those kinds of things and our mind is open to the influence of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who can make the changes that are necessary. 
Here's a couple of verses that raise some questions about the flip about that. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, Keep on working with fear and trembling to complete your salvation, because God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey His own purpose. Does that help? What does it mean to keep on working with fear and trembling to complete your salvation? Is that something we need to... Is it more than just giving God a chance well, to work in us? See, I, again, we have a problem with translation because the word obey is a Greek uh, word, hukapuo. Uh, hupakue. <laughs> hupakue, I'm sorry. And um, which means to listen attentively. Mm -hmm. uh, are we listening to the word? I mean, we want the spirit so badly that oftentimes we are calling on the spirit and we don't even know what the word really says. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We need that. We do. That faith. But I, I think one of the, yeah, well, one of the problems is that we think of salvation as one dimensional. Either I get there or I don't get there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think back to 1 Corinthians 3, there, if uh, the day will test what we build on it, and if, if uh, uh, the work remains, we receive a reward, but if it's burned up, then we suffer loss, but we still can be saved. So what we become, it's, it's like we're choosing what, what relationship we want with God, and mm -hmm. how close it is. Um, so, um, and when we think of reward, often we think of what's in it for me, but Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Mm -hmm. So really the reward of the righteous is their capacity to give, which is dependent on their capacity to receive from the mm -hmm. giver of all good gifts. Yeah. And that brings us back to where we started with uh, the divine nature and and uh, our connection to God. Well, in 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11, he ends up, in this way you'll be given the full right to enter into, into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, you've all, I'm sure, heard some people use this illustration that when Enoch was here on this earth, uh, he was such a friend of God that one day God just said, well, it's closer to my house than it is to yours. Why don't we just <laughs> come home to my house? Uh, and we sort of smile when we hear that story, but there's some truth to that. Um, so if we've it truly experienced the living according to Peter's instructions or directions, and the first seven verses of this short letter, then Peter calls upon us to be what we really can be. And that's where we got our title for this lesson, Be What You Are. So, of course, Peter's saying, if you take advantage of the steps that he's already talked about, the stacking up here of all, all these virtues, you can be a representative of Jesus Christ. Do we really know Jesus? How many, how many Christians really know and understand Jesus? As it is our privilege to know, yeah. as an earlier quotation. Do we really want to live as he did? Or it's, it's, I, I'm happy you did that, Jesus. Now let me be on with my life. Thank you very much for forgiving me, and I need to be forgiven more and more every day, but thank you very much. I'll just go on living my life. I don't think that's what he's talking about. No. Well, Peter's letter reminds us that there are many Christians who have failed to accomplish this new reality in their lives, but he was certain that there is no excuse for their behavior. So what is the relationship between faith and works? How many discussions have you heard on this question? <laughs> well, faith again, and works. again, it's uh, the word pistis, which is translated faith, faith mm -hmm. is really uh, means persuasion. Mm -hmm. Is your persuasion all founded on love? God is love. Or is your persuasion just a matter of uh, going to church on one day a week or having your prayers on a daily basis. If we have a persuasion that is related to God, it is a relationship of love because we 
appreciate not so much God as a person, we appreciate his love and want to become increasingly more like him. And thus, we will end up loving others mm -hmm. likewise. A well, faith, a faith that works. Yeah. You know, it's like you could go out in the desert and find an abandoned automobile and bring it back and put it in a sealed case in a museum and save it. Or you could fix it up and drive it down the road, which is the best way to, yeah. to be saved Yeah. <laughs> if an automobile could think. Ellen White has an interesting passage found in her Signs of the Times, 1890. She says, we hear a great deal about faith, and we need to hear more about faith, but we need to hear a great deal more about works. Many are deceiving their own souls by living an easygoing, accommodating, crossless religion. So what is she included in the, the works part? What is she including there? Well, this crossless religion is an interesting statement because it mean, it, when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, it, he implies that there's going to be some pain involved along the way, but we'll do it with joy because what is more rewarding than to love even our enemies? Mm -hmm. And yeah. as Paul said, for I have died, that's what the cross really, really is. comes yeah. down to, yeah. is, uh, is I have died and, and yet I live, mm -hmm. but it is Christ who lives in me. Here's a question that I have puzzled on, and maybe some of you can help me. Several times, even fairly early in his ministry, Jesus talks about taking up the cross. What in the world did the disciples think he was talking about? Oh, the they cross? could not understand at first. What in the, the cross? <laughs> the cross was an instrument of Roman torture. Yeah. I mean, what could he possibly be talking about? They must have, huh? Scratch their head. Well, this is where you realize that when he says it is better that I go away, I don't think he was talking about going to heaven. I think he was going, talking about going to his grave through that cross that would lead him to the grave mm -hmm. unless you pick up your cross. In other words, unless you're willing to bleed for the sake of those who yeah. hate you by loving them as I do, love one another as I have loved you. This is what he's calling us. Yeah. Well, could we, could, have you tried, uh, asked you out there as well, have you th actually tried to put yourself into the stories of Jesus and the stories of the gospel? Yeah. Try to think about what you would have done if you had been in Peter's place, because we're thinking especially about Peter right now. And Peter and James and John, and think about the things that happened to them on many occasions, from fishing all night to other things like that. How would you survive doing that? Um, can you think of some modern situations which would be parallel somehow or other to some of the stories of Jesus or the disciples? Well, look at verses 13 and 14 of Second Peter 1. I'm quoting, I think it only right for me to stir up your memory of these matters as long as I am still alive. I know that I shall soon put off this mortal body as our Lord Jesus Christ plainly told me. I will do my best then to provide a way for you to remember these matters at all times after my death. Now that's an interesting thing. How would he possibly do that? How you the, the way I look at it, again, um, we must focus not on our physical desires of the self, which is my tent, mm -hmm. which I'll put away. I don't really care. It's not that important. What's important is what comes that has to be founded on the love for others, which is what Peter, I think, understood very clearly. But how is he going to remind us about this after he's dead? By writing these things down. Okay. There's a very specific way he did it, and I'm going to give you a hint about it right now. Um, go back, if you have your Bible open, just uh, one chapter into the last little bit of First Peter. And it says something very interesting there. Your sister church in Babylon, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son, Mark. Who is Mark? John Mark. John Mark, what do we know about him? Well, quite a lot. 
but not directly. You know, he's okay. probably the young man who ran away uh, in the garden. I guess almost he, certainly, John <laughs> followed the disciples when and Jesus and the disciples when they went from his mother's home or his parents' home in Jerusalem, where, where, where the upper room was located, uh, and you can you can figure that out by comparing the story of Peter getting out of prison over in the book of Acts and, and click, follow it back. But almost certainly he was there. But most important here is that we have a gospel by the name of Mark. And that many scholars have agreed with the idea that it's really Peter's gospel. So here Mark is with Peter. And when he wrote down, so how do you think Peter uh, tried to help, made it possible for us to remember all these things after he was dead? Having Mark write him down. He had Mark write him down. Yeah, and there you can just, one chapter apart from First Peter to Second Peter, you can see how that would have been easy to do. And how, actually how he did it, I guess, is more precise. Well, our, our lesson talks a little bit about this expression, I must put off this tent. Um, and you've already suggested, Fred, that uh, he's talking about his body. Modern versions usually say, I must put off this body. There's an interesting comment here. In 1956, Oscar Coleman wrote a short story called Immortality of the Soul or Resurrection of the Dead, The Witness of the New Testament. He argued that the concept of the resurrection is quite incompatible with the concept of the immortal soul. Furthermore, he said that the New Testament lies squarely on the side of the resurrection of the dead. Then he comments later, no other publication of mine, he later wrote, has provoked such enthusiasm or such violent hostility. Mm -hmm. And if you get our, our handouts, uh, uh, available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you download this thing, you'll have the link there and you can actually look at um, the short document that he wrote. So we as Seventh-day Adventists clearly believe that human beings are mortal. That when our, that as, just as Jesus, God said back in the beginning in Genesis, when you put a body together with a, with a breath, you get a living soul. So body plus, bre plus breath equals a soul. So once the, the breath is gone, the body is a body, but there's no more soul. The soul ceases to exist when the, when the breath is gone out of the body. And we believe that, that um, a person who is dead is in a dreamless sleep. Uh, and that sleep will be interrupted once again for everybody, either at the second coming or the third coming, depending upon which resurrection you come up in. Paul talks a lot about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at just a few of those verses. We can't take time to read the whole chapter, basically. He says, Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from death, how can some of you say that the dead will not be raised to life? If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. I'm going to see. I think <coughs> I can get this a little bit larger. It might be easier to read. Uh, and if Christ has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. More than that, we are shown to be lying about God because we said that he raised Christ from death. But if it is true that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. It would almost mean... it. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in the world. And I would argue with that a little bit. I don't think that Christians need to live any worse lives than others. I think we have a lot of those who practice the Christian lifestyle that we have been taught um, through the writings of the Bible and Ellen White live healthier, longer lives. We know that. It's been demonstrated repeatedly, not only by Adventists, but by others. In fact, just about a week ago, I read an article, it's the latest research, quote-unquote, uh, was that it's even healthier if you eat 10 servings of vegetables or fruits every day, and not just five as recommended by <laughs> the federal government. 
So uh, does that sound vaguely like what Adventists have been recommending for a long time? Well, Paul made it very clear that if Christ did not rise from the grave, then our faith is useless. So this, this raises a question in my mind I'd like to pose to you. Which is more important for our salvation, the death of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus? The equally as important. It's a bad question. That's oh, right. <laughs> that's, a, that's the right answer. Yeah. So they, they go together, don't they? I mean, even if Jesus had apparently done everything right and he died on the cross, if he didn't come forth from the grave... There wouldn't be any hope. There wouldn't be any hope. What would be the hope? And if he somehow just got raised from, from, from death, but he never demonstrated the truth about sin and its consequences through his, through his death, what would we have? So we need both of those. We need he, By his resurrection, he came forth in his own power. He said, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it up again, and he did. So this proves that in contrast to Lucifer, who, who really claimed that he was equal with Jesus Christ, Jesus was divine. And I, I know that Jesus wouldn't sarcastically say anything, but how many of the good angels wanted to say to the evil angels as Jesus came forth from his grave, say, let, let your Satan do that. See if he can raise himself from the dead, you know. Well, but the truth, of course, is that the, the crucifixion and the resurrection are real. Um, there's nothing fake about it at all. And, and, and this, in the, there's nothing in the New Testament to suggest that some essence of wafts its way off, leaving the body behind and dwelling somewhere in another world. It's completely foreign to the Bible as we know it. So, what kind of bodies will we receive in the resurrection? Incorruptible. Incorruptible. What does that mean? It won't decay. It won't decay. Sister White says in one, some couple spots that we may we, we will rise as we went into the grave, except that we'll have these these incorruptible bodies, these perfect bodies, and then we will grow up. So we know that Adam was more than twice as tall as men now living. So we got a little growing to do. That's only the physical growth. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Not we'll be growing forever spiritually and mentally. Yeah. Um, by the way, have you ever heard anyone try to estimate um, what Adam weighed and what Eve weighed? Well, probably close to a ton. <laughs> yeah. Adam was probably close to a ton. Eve was probably, and I've heard people say this, ladies, you know, you can stop worrying about losing weight. Eve weighed about 1,500 pounds. <laughs> probably more than that. <laughs> uh, well. Yeah. well, the interesting, what evidence would you provide from Scripture that... Um, Jesus rose with a real body? Well, in the upper room, uh, Thomas uh, had doubted the week before, and so when he appeared, he said, you know, touch me, feel me. Mm -hmm. Spirit doesn't have flesh and blood, so yeah. flesh and bones. So we don't know exactly what the nature of his reality is, but it's real. There's no question about that. He probably doesn't have a you know, the exact same internal organs that we have and they're working exactly the same way. Maybe or he, he does. Full control over it. He does. <laughs> he could show up in the room without coming through the door, apparently. Yeah, yeah. So we will have perfect and immortal bodies um, when we rise from the grave. Do uh, you think they'll be perfect? Well, what do you mean by perfect? That's the yeah, question. That's, that's the question. <laughs> uh, not mature yet. I think we still have some growing to do, as I already mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so this I letter... be happy with them instead of the way yes. people obsess about, exactly. I, I hate this or I hate that. Yeah. We'll be happy with them. Yeah, exactly. But it still appears that, based on the statement you just read from Ellen White, that uh, Adam and Eve will be a lot taller than we are at the resurrection time. Which yeah. means that, in a way, physically, they haven't suffered all that degeneration. Yep. Uh, therefore, they are more perfect, in a way, than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, now, in light of those verses we just read a moment ago, what was Peter's reason for writing these two letters? 
especially the second letter. What did he say was going to happen? He says, I know. Let's just read the verses. Second Peter 1, verses 12 to 14. And so I will always remind you of these matters, even though you already know them and are firmly grounded in the truth you have received. I think it only right for me to stir up your memory of these matters as long as I am still alive. I know that I shall soon put off this mortal body, as our Lord Jesus Christ plainly told me. It will do my, I will do my best then to provide a way for you to remember these matters at all times after my death. So we could, in essence, call, call this letter, especially Second Peter, but both First and Second Peter, a kind of last will and testament of Peter. He says, I'm, this is my will for you when I'm gone, and here are these, these two letters. What did, uh, remember what, the, what Jesus said to Peter that seemed to think, give him a hint about how he was going to die? Remember what it says in John 21, verse 18? Take care of my sheep. I am telling you the truth. When you were young, you used to go get ready and go anywhere you wanted to. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will bind you and take you where you don't want to go. And how did Peter understand that? The way he would die. The way he would die. Here's a a very interesting passage that spells it out from Ellen White. In the providence of God, Peter was permitted to close his ministry in Rome. Now, uh, I've shown some of you a picture of this, and some of you may have been there. I hope some of you have been there. There is well preserved in that, there's a, there's a church over the top of it, but underneath that church, just a short distance from the Roman Senate, down in the middle of Rome, there is what we call the Mamertine Prison. And in Peter's day, there was a little small round hole and you, they dropped you down through that hole and then there was a little bit of a drain to let out the, the waste matter at the bottom. But there's no way you could get out through the drain. And there you were. There was nothing you could do. It was, the ceiling is too high for you to get up to it. Uh, and it's quite likely that Peter and Paul were both pr imprisoned in that prison, in that room at the same time. But anyway, so there they are, imprisoned by Nero, about the time of Paul's final arrest, Ellen White says, thus the two veteran apostles who for many years had been widely separated in their labors were to bear their last witness for Christ and the world's metropolis. And upon its soil to shed their blood as the seed of a vast harvest of saints and martyrs. Um, just a little bit of history. What were the largest cities in the Roman Empire? Remember? Rome, Antioch. Rome was the largest. Actually, the city down in Egypt was second. Alexandria. Alexandria was the second largest. And Antioch and what is, what is now Turkey but used to be Syria was number three. Uh, some people have said maybe it was a competition between Antioch and, and Ephesus. Ephesus is probably number four, but that just gives you a little idea. Reading on in Ellen White, since his reinstatement after his denial of Christ, Peter had unflinchingly braved danger and had shown a noble courage in preaching a crucified, risen, and ascended Savior. What group was Peter primarily sent out to work with? Do you remember? Peter? Was what, was, what was his? To what, the Jews. To the Jews. And Paul? To the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. And now they've come together and they're both imprisoned in the same place. Uh, as he lay in his cell, he called to mind the words that Christ had spoken to him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. John 21, 18. Thus Jesus made known to the disciple the very manner of his death and even foretold the stretching of his hands upon the cross. Peter, as a Jew and a foreigner, was, was condemned to be scourged and crucified. In prospect of this fearful death, the apostle remembered his great sin in denying Jesus in the hour of his trial. Once so unready to acknowledge the cross, he now counted it a joy to yield up his life for the gospel, feeling only that for him who had denied his Lord to die in the same manner as his master died was too great an honor. Peter had sincerely repented of that sin and had been forgiven by Christ. 
as is shown by the high commission given him to feed the sheep and lambs of the flock. But he could never forgive himself. Not even the thought of the agonies of the last terrible scene could lessen the bitterness of his sorrow and repentance. As a last favor, he entreated his executioners that he might be nailed to the cross with his head downward. The request was granted, and in this manner died the great apostle Peter. Acts of the Apostles 537 538. So where does that story come from? This tradition, but um, it seems to be a historical reality. It's, it's part of the what we call the early Christian fathers. It's written by people who lived maybe within 50 years or 70 years after Jesus. We ha still have their writings. And Ellen White supports it as being a, 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 a true fact. Well, what about us? As we face the future and potentially the, the final events on this earth's history, should we, should we be terrified and frightened of death? No. Or should we have the hope that the disciples had? should have that hope. We do have this ingrained sense of self-preservation, though. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. protects us physically, you know, from things. But, um, but uh, we should be willing to go where we don't want to go, as Peter did, I guess. But that sense of uh, self-preservation should never get us to hurt anyone. Yeah. And certainly not our enemies, as Jesus showed it so well. Yeah. So self-preservation doesn't mean self-preservation at any cost. It means as long as you can practice love, it's okay. But otherwise, it's out of bound. Well, what means does God provide? Now, reviewing, let's, let's do a little bit of reviewing of our study. What means does God provide for leaving behind the corruption that is in the world through lust? and attaining to God's divine power unto immortality and eternal life, using Peter's words in those first few verses of Second Peter 1. He says it's a knowledge of Jesus Christ and of God the Father. By the way, there's an interesting thing we didn't, I thought maybe we wouldn't have time to talk about it, but maybe we do. Notice this, that in, in 1 Peter chapter, uh, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, from Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through, right, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have been given a faith as precious as ours. The way the Greek was constructed that our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, it tells us that Jesus Christ is God. It means it's, it's, he's one and the same thing, the God, the Savior, this is the same the same essence. And these verses were asked, talking about God's divine power has given us everything we need to live a truly religious life through our knowledge of the one who called us to share in his own glory and godliness, goodness. I'm sorry. So basically what, uh, what Peter is saying is you, by, by giving you these writings that we have put together, Paul's writings and my writings and the other gospel writers, the other New Testament writers, by giving you these, we provided you with everything you need to participate with God in eternal life. You can, it is this, the, inf the evidence is there for you to get to know Jesus Christ, to get to know God, and you can thus become a partaker of the divine character. How, how, how do you think that works? How do we become a partaker of the divine nature? I think John six, John six sixty three uh, tells us very clearly what it is. The words I have spoken to you, they are spirit, they are life. Therefore, our life is highly dependent on those words. In other words, the message here is actually the word logos that is used in the Greek. And logos is a message. And what does uh, Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1 18? It's the message of the cross. Yeah. That saves us. Yeah. It's not the cross itself. It's the message of that cross. A lot of quotes you've had this evening are about knowledge. And John 17, yeah. eternal life is to know the, the Father and, and Jesus Christ to whom he is sent. I mean, yeah. it's just full of these things. But uh, the essence, the, the goal is eternal life 
is to know. And that real knowing is, is captured by the Greek word that we translate as faith or trust. If faith or trust is a relationship with God that comes out of our knowledge of God that brings us close to Him. Or it could be used as persuasion from the mm -hmm. same, same thing, and that is how does God com communicate through knowledge and uh, the, um, we're not, what I'm looking for, uh, have, the, the words he has spoken are spirit and life yeah. there and so forth. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. 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 So we have an opportunity as Christians to do three things. Bible study, which, through which God speaks to us, prayer in which we respond to him, and then witnessing. And what's the role of witnessing in that process? Why is that important? We've talked about that here before. It's about giving. It's about giving, that's important. But you have to do some studying in order to have something to give. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and I was going to say earlier, uh, knowledge of God is essential because how do we know where to go if we don't know Him? He is love. Not knowing God is not knowing love. Not knowing what love is is not knowing what life is about. I, I know what I meant to say earlier, and that is persuasion has to do with knowledge, and, not, and that's the way God communicates is through, uh, through a message. Mm -hmm. And then through that message, we can become persuaded or convinced or have faith or belief or trust, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, boil it down. So. Yeah. I, I can remember my own personal experience, if you'll allow me for a moment. The first time I heard Dr. Graham Maxwell, my wonderful friend and mentor, talk about why Jesus had to die, I was so excited. I said, I have never heard anyone really explain it like that before. That same afternoon, I was going with a group of people in a little old Volkswagen back in the 60s, driving down to the beach because we had a Vespers planned. Our, our medical school class had a Vespers planned on the beach. And I thought, okay, this is my chance. I'm going to explain to people why Jesus had to die. And I started to, and I got in the middle somewhere, and I couldn't remember how to get to the next step. And I, oh, how could, I mean, I was so excited about it, and yet, so what we learn by trying to explain something to somebody else is how well we understand it. Well, you have a tar tough time with most Bible translations yeah. trying to explain it, because most Bible translations, Romans 3.25, is, has stuff that is incorporated in there that's not in the text. Yeah, yeah. And it's trying to explain with, with a Bible translation, there's only maybe a, three or four of them that are any cl we're close to right in Romans 3.25. So Peter, in his talking about our effort, basically it's our effort to develop that kind of a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only part we can do. Give God a chance to develop in us that faith, that learning about God, talking to God, praying, Bible study, that relationship. And of course, that's what's described in Romans 10, 17, where it says, so then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through <coughs> preaching Christ or the message about God. So do we fully comprehend what it means to be partakers of the divine nature? How do we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust and evil desire? And here's a note from our Bible study guide. In our passage, Peter tells us how we can accomplish all these goals. We must have an effective and productive knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ who called us to emulate His holiness. See 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. After describing the latter of Christian virtues, Peter says, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.8 Through the divine power made available in the precious promises of His Word, God permits us to become partakers of the divine nature and to escape the cor corrupt natures we have inherited in this world. Thus He fits us for eternity. Well, in talking about the many virtues that are mentioned in those four or five different passages about the different virtues that add together, Paul suggested that they are a fruit. We've talked about this before, but it's all one message. We've suggested that love produces all the rest of those characteristics that we truly have love. Um, 
we need to be very clear that these virtues, the ones that Peter talks about, are a gift from God. However, we need to exercise our choice by allowing the Holy Spirit to enter our lives through Bible study and prayer so that he can make the necessary changes in us. Well, in a previous lesson, we talked about how Peter focused a great deal on Jesus Christ in his first letter. And now, as Peter begins his second epistle, he continues his emphasis on the centrality of Jesus Christ that we saw in his first epistle. In the first 15 verses that we will be studying this week, there are six explicit references to Jesus Christ, usually either as Lord or as God, plus many other references to him through the use of personal pronouns. In verse 1, through a Greek grammatical construction, Jesus is called both our God and Savior. In verses 2, 8, 11, and 14, Jesus is designated as our Lord. And all but verse 2 is called Jesus Christ or Jesus the Messiah. In verse 11, he is our Lord and Savior. Clearly, Peter has a very high Christology and wants to communicate this interpretation to his readers. He is proud to bear the name that Jesus gave him, Simon Peter, that is the rock, and to be a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, as we review our own lives, uh, what ways do we see that Jesus is becoming more and more, our lives are becoming more and more like Jesus? Does it seem like an impossible task? Are we working on it every day? Is the Bible, all of it, an important source of knowledge for us? Peter was certain that a knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the key to our successful growth as Christians. We should remember one thing. If our picture of God has not changed in the last year, we are worshiping an idol. That's a scary thought. Some Christians, we feel that God has called us to be absolutely perfect. Others feel that, it's a, that perfection is, re is relative. What's the difference? Well, you know Matthew 5, 48, we are to be perfect. Ellen White says we may be as perfect in our sphere as God is in his sphere. God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought can reach. But be therefore perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. This command, she says, is a promise. So when God commands us to do something, he gives us the ability and the capacity to accomplish that thing with his help, of course, too, with the help of the angels and the Holy Spirit. And our calling to you in this lesson is to take advantage of all those things that God offers you. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to study together, to learn from your word. May we daily have a growing experience and a better relationship with you as a result is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.